So I want to talk about from retirement to renacement. I have to tell you that renacement isn't a particularly proper word. It's something that I sort of thought of, really, because I have a problem with retirement, and I'll try and explain why. In 1882, Anthony Trollope wrote a book called The Fixed Period. It would have been a good book for the euthanasia people to read because he, this was in 1882, it was his only sort of dystopian science fiction novel and he set the novel in 1980. And he described an island which gained independence from Great Britain. Once they'd gained independence, he described how the government was set up of young men in their 30s and they decided that to run an economic island that was successful it would be best if people worked until they were 67 and then they would go into an institution called the college where they prepare themselves and at the end of a year they'd be bumped off and they'd be cremated and this was all wonderful uh, and the island flourished the problem was when they people who'd made the laws got to the age of 67 and then they started to have some second thoughts. I came to the island in 1975 and my training had been as a vascular surgeon as part from being general surgeon but vascular surgeon. My specialty was, was vascular surgery which is operating on people's arteries. Now one of the difficult operations that I had to do was the resection of an aortic aneurysm and the aneurysm, I don't know if it's going to work, no, hang on, yeah, um, the aneurysm is here in the, in the tummy and it's like a, a small rugby football and it, it develops in people, um, often people who've been smoking or who have arterial disease. To operate on an aneurysm is is really a very difficult technical thing to do and it requires a full team. This is, um, sorry to show you this, this is a aneurysm which is being operated on as a planned procedure. The, the, the big, this, this is all blood vessel here, it's like a hand grenade and if you perforate it, it will explode. An aneurysm doesn't always present like this. Sometimes it presents as a ruptured aneurysm. In the middle of the night, a patient comes in in extremis. It is one of the worst and most horrifying emergencies that you can imagine. You don't see any of this as just a sea of blood and you have minutes only in order to get control and sort things out. I hadn't been in the island very long when the phone went and a ruptured aneurysm was presenting in the hospital. After about six or seven hours work with an anaesthetist who I believe was Dr. Bound, who this room is named after, who was a general practitioner who was extending his skills into very complex anaesthesia, after about six or seven hours we were able to return the patient to the ward for sort of intensive care because there wasn't much intensive care. I rang the blood bank after this to thank them. The receiver was picked up and the words were, hello, this is Joe Baird in what used to be the blood bank. I had used every ounce of blood on the island. Now fortunately for me, because had this patient not survived, I think I'd been on the next train home. Now when it came to drawing up a practice agreement as a young person arriving in the practice, I had no hesitation at the age of 35 of joining with other mostly male youngish people in saying retirement will come at 65. We don't want time expired past their sell by date surgeons particularly hanging around in the practice. It wasn't very long because life is a bit like a toilet roll they tell me. It, it sort of goes on nicely but then it runs out rather quickly at the end and it wasn't very long before I found myself 65 and the partnership thought it'd be a really good idea they wanted me to go the next day my birthday but they thought it'd be a good idea that I should do the last night on call it seemed fair enough I'd just gone to bed 
and the phone rang just after midnight, and in came a person with a ruptured aneurysm. As I was driving home after seven hours work against the traffic, I felt absolutely exhausted, but I felt relieved. The patient had gone to the intensive care unit, I'd sort of completed my compulsory work in life, and I was actually, at eight o'clock that morning, officially retired. It was five years before a very nice gentleman came up and shook my hand and said, thank you very much for not retiring a day earlier. Now, my job then was this. I was down all my surgical skills, as far as everybody's concerned, were in the bin. And I had therefore a job of peeling vegetables, peeling potatoes. I was quite good with carrots because I'd had to do quite a lot of circumcisions in my time. <laughs> and and carrots, carrots worked out pretty well. But it did, it did bring it home to me that this was a fairly sudden retirement. Now, I had another string to my bow in a way because I knew that the Imperial Cancer Research Fund had been working on the island from the years of 1969 to 1999 and many women, many of you in this room I know, volunteered to give uh, urine samples and blood samples for prospective cancer research. 11,000 women out of that, a lot of women considering they're all over 35 and that's, that's the criteria. I met a chap called Paul Townsend. Some of you may have met him three weeks ago when he was giving a talk in this room. Now, Paul was a young lecturer and he was living in a cupboard. This was his cupboard with bottles and things like that. And we got together and said, what if we looked at these blood samples that the Imperial Cancer Research had and we looked at them with a, a technique that didn't exist in those days when they had it. And that technique was called proteomics. That started us off, well, it, uh, the problem was, sorry, the problem was we didn't have any money, but I was chairman of Hope for Guernsey, and they um, raised money for Wessex Medical Research. So I asked, or we asked, Wessex Medical Research for a grant of £15,000, a so-called innovation grant, to study these samples in a laboratory in Guildford, a private laboratory in Guildford. We said, we'll make it easy for you. We'll raise all the money in Guernsey, uh, and you have to just audit it and put your peer review in place and then give it all back to us. And remarkably, they did agree to do that. The only problem I had to do was to swim the channel. I don't know whose idea it was. Um, it might have been mine because I didn't know much about it in those days. In the event, the people of Guernsey were extremely generous and there was something like 75,000 pounds to play with. And that set us off on a roller coaster of research and exploration. This is some of the team. Now, Derek Coates is in there and he was incredibly supportive because what happened was having done the channel once, which I swore I'd never ever do again, five years later they said, well, we really do need a mass spectrometer which cost half a million pounds. Can you just give us 500,000 from Guernsey? And we couldn't see a way apart from some idea of swimming the channel again for the world record. Anyway, Derek Coates put his hand in his pocket and gave, he said, if you do it, I'll give you 250,000 of my own money. And also Healthspan will be behind it. And Healthspan put in 100 and whatever. So we were nearly there. And with Becky Simmons, who you can see second from the end there, um, I could just there, that's Becky, and Paul Mason, who also swam the channel that year, we were able to purchase the mass spectrometer that they needed. And this is Derek Coates. He's actually got a, a um, it's a cake baster for the idea for the photograph, but it was just to make it look as though he was doing something. And the <laughs> Dean of Medicine behind him, and Paul Townsend looking like a, a newborn baby up there. Um, that's the front end of the machine, but there's another whole lot of it, the thing is about the size of a transit van. But that, that kept us going, and that was certainly something to keep me amused in the early years of retirement. When I got home, then uh, there was this lovely um, um, decorated sheet, should we call it, which the grandchildren had done. And I was really, I look a bit glum there, because I think I just got back, but um, they, they, they were really nice. And the congratulations of doing the channel a second time came in two forms. This was the sincere form, 
and then there was a slightly less severe form, so sincere form. Congratulations to Roger Allsop. This was in the papers this week. Age 70, he has become the oldest person to swim the channel. Isn't that great? I think what a marvellous thing to do. 70 years old, he swam the channel. What an achievement. Mind you, he was only 52 when he got in. So maybe... <laughs> imagine how wrinkly his body was when he reached Calais, eh? He must have come out looking like Alan Sugar's scrotum. <laughs> and speaking as one of the few straight men who've seen that, I can tell you it needs a good ironing. Now, <laughs> that's right, I've learned nothing. <laughs> um, I, I thought it would be worth writing to him, so I, I read this to you because it might be difficult. It's thank you for featuring my channel swim during the introduction of your really great series. Um, the reason I undertook the challenge was to raise 750,000 for groundbreaking cancer work, research. Many people have been very generous and donating to the cause. I enclosed two sample thank you letters with an image of me being fished out in France. I wondered if this image might be used to put the nation's mind at rest in respect to my appearance and that of Alan Sugar's scrotum <laughs> at the end of the swim. You clearly know Alan Sugar more intimately than I do, and I'd be most grateful if you could pass him a copy, together with the enclosed information leaflet, which explains what we do and why. Together, or individually, if Alan does not want to play ball, no pun intended, you could make a big difference. Now, since that time, my alarm clock has been set for six o'clock every morning, and I get up and I rush down to see what's come in the post and I'm still waiting. Aww. Nothing has happened. So, then I had a senior moment. Um, the, the, uh, having had a, a really wonderful swim out at Kobo one morning on the way home, this happened. Now, the problem was this, an elderly man. I mean, this is... <laughs> I had somewhere between 25 and 30 fractures. They were nothing compared to this news. Here was I, <laughs> age 70, an elderly man. I was absolutely horrified. I wrote, a, while still on the intensive care unit, I wrote an article for one of the international swimming magazines, which was uh, called H2 Open, and described what had happened. We had this wonderful swim. Uh, here was I laid up with tubes and pipes and God knows what. Um, but I said, I thought that really, you know, swimming the channel is quite hard and it's going to help me get better. Um, so uh, the article was well received, but what really shocked me was people said, well, oh, that's fine. We know you'll be all right, but what about the car? <laughs> so I thought, well, what about the car, you know? Um, and it brought it home to me that we don't really have a great deal of respect for old people in the West. And I wondered what it was about an old car or an antique that made them sought after, valuable, and that our old people tend to get denigrated, they're in the way, and one thing and another. And I thought, well, maybe it's just that there's too many of us in the old people brigade. But then there's more to it, really, because one finds that age as a source of causing humour to other people is quite well used, if you were actually making a comment on, based on race or on sex, it would be absolutely taboo. But age, that's okay, you can do that, there's no, no problem there. And then I came across this, which conclusive research showed that negative thoughts about ageing can cause disastrous consequences to individuals' health. And I thought we've all got negative thoughts about ageing, or we could do, or tend to. And then I saw this card. I mean, it's, it's absolutely appalling, isn't it? But then it's not really, because it's much, much more important to maintain a sense of humour than get upset about something like that. But there's no question, we are all getting older, and the statistics are that there are many more centenarians now in the UK, but in particular, if you look at Japan, they have rocketed up. And in Japan, you used to get a little silver sake cup when you reached 100, 
uh, they had to replace that with a silver plated thing and I think now you just get a piece of paper so there's just, there's just too many of them oh, I just want to put her off a minute sorry she said so, so I was concerned about this ageing thing and I, and I looked at it a bit more and I found that we have two ages we have a chronological age uh, which is the age that we have been around it's, it's how long the clock has been ticking we can't do anything about that but we also have a biological age and recently a lot of research has been done which shows that your biological age can be influenced by your lifestyle you can accelerate it or you can decelerate it and I'll show you the picture of the, the Queen on her, uh, I think that was her 90th birthday. And I'd like you to compare this with another famous person, Ziggy Pop, on his 70th birthday. And now both of these people could afford to live a good lives. So it wasn't um, that they were poor that makes a difference in their appearances. Actually, Iggy Pop's not doing badly because he's on a lot of tablets, but he's, I believe he's still around, so he's doing good. Now, taking this... As I read about this, this is um, John Robbins, and he was due to inherit the um, Robbins empire of ice cream in America. So he, he, he was going to be a successful chap, a very rich man, but he decided that he was much more interested in health. And he wrote this book, Healthy at 100. In the book, he describes this chap, Dr. Alexander Leaf. Dr. Alexander Leaf died last year in his 90s. And he was commissioned by the National Geographic to visit various parts of the world where people were known to live a long time. And there was Abkhazia, which is in the Caucasus Mountains in Russia, or what was then Russia. There was Vilcabamba, which is in Ecuador. And there was the Hunza Valley, which is a secluded valley in the northernmost corner of top of Pakistan, where it borders with China and Russia. And if you look at these places, that's Abkhazia, it looks, looks okay to me. Uh, this is Vilcabamba, again, that looks okay to me. And the Hunza Valley, all nice places, all mountainous. And with his, he spent a long time there and studied the, the area very carefully. And this is what he found. And this is extraordinary. They had no heart disease, no cancer, no diabetes, no strokes, no cirrhosis, no senility, and no atherosclerosis. And in Hunza, they had asthma, was, I'd never heard of it. So this was, and this was done, this research was done 50 years ago when these areas were somewhat pristine. They were completely separate, different parts of the world, but they were unaffected by Western, Westernization or Western culture. So why? Well, this is, these were the factors that he found. It was kindness and respect shown to children and the elderly. This got my interest going. I thought, hmm, this is good. At least somebody's being interested in the elderly for once. Lifelong extreme physical exercise and fitness diet and the fact that they remain slim. And it was as simple as that. Those were the, those were the factors that seemed to prevent these illnesses in, that, in those particular areas. This is um, Okinawa, which is the southernmost group of islands in Japan. It's 161 islands, most beautiful place. Okinawa was the scene of the most bloody battle of the Second World War. And more people were killed in Okinawa than Hiroshima and Nagasaki put together. And when the war was over, the Americans kept their bases. These are the bases that they have there. The Okinawans had more people living to 100 and beyond than anywhere else in the world. And they seemed to live healthily. They looked young, they lived healthily, and then they got to 100 or a bit more, quite a bit more than that. And then they had a sudden decline and died. Since the Americans arrived in Okinawa, the number of hamburger joints has increased so there are more hamburger joints in Okinawa than there are in any other province in Japan. And it is now, sadly, not unusual for the elders of Okinawa to, see the, to, to attend the funerals of their grandchildren. That is the difference that the diet and the Americanization has made. This is the, the, the final research. So this was after many years of research, proper research. If North Americans lived more like the elder Okinawa, we would have to close 80% of the coronary care units, one third of cancer wards in the United States, and a lot of the nursing homes would be out of business. So an extraordinary difference due to the way people live. 
So how do the Okinawans do it? Well, they not dissimilar. Culture of respect for the elderly, profound sense of sharing, caring, always a great deal of physical exercise, simple, nutritious, wholesome food, and less calories than the West and stay slim. Premier Chen Lai was the Premier of China in the 70s, and he was dying of liver cancer. And he ordered a survey of the whole of China to find out the cause, of the number of deaths from cancer and the, and the different types of cancer. And he surveyed 98% of 880 million people. And what he found, or what they found, was that the incidence of cancer in Japan varied very much from state to state. This interested the world scientists. So in 1983, they started an international study which was called the China Study, and they looked at the whole question of the incidence of illness and disease in China. And what they found was that there were two types of illness. One was associated with poverty and deprivation, and the other was associated with excess and opulence. And these were, and, and they, uh, when um, Sir Richard Peter, who was the statistician who looked at our Guernsey figures, um, looked at the China study, this is what he said, that coronary heart disease is unnecessary. That is the most foremost statistician in the world has made a statement like that. So it is important. Now, this is a terrible picture. In 1989, Romania encouraged people to have large families. They, couldn't, they weren't allowed to look after the kids. It says abandoned children. They weren't abandoned. They were taken into care by the government. And the government put them, in effect, in cages. They were cots, but they were essentially cages. They received no stimulation whatsoever. That is a brain scan of a normal child at the top compared with this extreme neglect of one of the Romanian children. They have all been returned to the homes, their homes now, but the damage that was caused by this neglect of the young brain, uh, it was to a degree irreparable. I want to tell you quickly about the religious order study. We are dotting around somewhere. This is done in America. 11,000 nuns, priests, brothers, all identical lifestyle, or pretty well, they all live together. And they said that they would be happy to be studied intensely of what their lifestyle was, what their hobbies were, what they did. And when they died, they denote their, they donate their brains for medical research. And this is what they did with the brains, chopped them up and, and examined them carefully. And what has been found, there were 350 brains were examined. Again, this is unique, unique work. This doesn't happen very often. But they found there were positives which kept people sane, if you like, kept them active mentally. The positive cognitive exercise, the things you know, crosswords, reading, driving, learning new skills, responsibility, social activity, social network. Does this sound familiar? We've heard about some of this tonight, haven't we? Uh, physical activity and keeping busy. But there were negatives as well. And the negatives were loneliness, anxiety, depression, proneness to physical distress and inactivity. Coming back to Wales now, Caerphilly, I, I don't know whether they make cheese, but it always makes me think it might have made cheese in Caerphilly, but uh, whatever. Anyway, they had 2,500 2, men, they studied for 35 years, and they've been studied for lifestyle factors. And it's a rather busy slide, but essentially, the five factors were no smoking, low body weight, exercise, um, not too much alcohol, that's not more than your doctor drinks, I think that's how they define not too much alcohol. Um, and what they found was extraordinary. If anybody, if people kept four out of five of those lifestyle factors, the diabetes was reduced by 73%, vascular disease 67%, cancer 18%, dementia 64%, and all cause deaths, 32%. I mean, these are staggering figures, and they're all statistically significant. So if the medical evidence is so convincing, and I think I've explained to you it is pretty convincing, why is it so difficult? I think one of the reasons it's so difficult is in the West we have been subjected to commercialism to an extreme degree. The cigarette companies knew very well in the 50s and 60s that they were killing people by making them smoke. 
Hundreds of thousands of people have died through the actions of the cigarette companies. Every public health measure to try to curb people smoking had been resisted at every stage. If we look at the food and drinks industry, then they are probably not very much better. And what has happened, I believe, is in the multinational corporations, instead of having a yearly return when the profits are announced and the shares go up or down, they now go on quarterly returns. And if there isn't a quarterly increase in profits, then the chief executive is on his way out. So the competition to make money is huge. And we know, we see in our own supermarkets, that the food industry do promote sugar at the checkout. They promote, um, they try to get the kids addicted to sugar. I mean, they won't, they won't say this, but in fact they had, they have, I know, employed psychologists who have analyzed the brain of very young kids of, of, to find out how do you get kids hooked on sugar? Because if they like the sugar, they eat more of the product and they, they become bigger, but they also, the sales go up. And what they found is that the brain, particularly the frontal lobes of the brain, responds to an instant craving. The frontal lobes is developmentally a fairly recent part of the brain. The midbrain is more sensible, if you like, and more concerned with um, um, living and looking after yourself. But the psychologists know that if they can convince the, the frontal lobes to make the decision, those kids, as they're screaming at the checkout, will want that sugar. They'll want to eat those cereals. And they try to make the kids brand aware by the time they're two years old or before. Now, obviously, this isn't the whole of the food industry, but we are subject, it is a major thing that we are subjected to these adverse, um, um, adverse trends. So, what the secrets, I, I just want to go quickly now into the secrets of growing older and staying healthy, because that's what we want to be about. We don't want to be growing older and getting demented and needing a lot of care. We don't want to be using a lot of Heidi's facilities in the hospital. We want to be out there doing stuff, staying healthy, and then perhaps have a quick terminal decline and be gone. At least that's what I would like. So the secrets are well known to everybody. This is the ones before. Those are the five. But I would suggest that it's more subtle than that. And these are five more. And this is what we learn from the communities where long life and health reigns, if you like. It's respect for the young and the elderly, both ends of the scale. Positive attitude to growing older, maintenance of social skills, cognitive reserve, busy, value your friends, rise the challenge, live younger, have fun. Those are the ones that are not so well known. And guess what? Health connections. We've heard, to, I didn't know what Bella was going to say tonight. But she said it, hasn't she? So well done, Health Connections, for focusing on these items. Now, I just want to mention retirement. This is the, the bugbear. My retirement was somewhat brutal, somewhat abrupt, should we say, from a ruptured aneurysm one minute to a potato peeling competition the next. <laughs> I have no regrets. I really did enjoy my compulsory working life immensely. I found it tiring. I didn't think I was going to live very long afterwards because when I started a surgical career, they said, well, you will live till you're 67. That's the, um, that's the actuary's approach. It's going to be stressful. You won't see much of your kids growing up, but whatever. Anyway, so mine was fairly abrupt. But I think we should actually think of it in terms of another thing, which we call, I believe, renaissance. And renaissance, instead of lying down on your couch. This is the 101 year old who jumped out of an aeroplane and, and, uh, and skydiving. And I've got a clip cutting here from the Times just two weeks ago of a 97 year old who won the Nobel Prize having been sacked by Oxford when he was 65 and he went to the States and last couple of few, few weeks ago he got the Nobel Prize aged 97. So it is a pity to be written off at an early stage. Now these are the survival curves from the Office of National Statistics, the most up-to-date ones. And there is a reason for concern, because 
year on year, the survival has gone up. And we had a lecture at St. Pierre Park about six months ago uh, by a professor who said that the progression is linear and that half the children born today should expect to live to 100. Well, not if you look at these graphs for the UK. What is happening is that there's a flattening and there's now even a suspicion that they are going down. And the concern about this is that the austerity measures within the UK are finally beginning to bite. And if you don't look after your old people and you don't have your social care for your families, if you don't look after your vulnerable, then the lifespan will go down. I would say to you that to have a good average lifespan in a community is a measure of success of that community. Okay, it may be that we cost a bit to keep, but actually the kids cost quite a lot as well because the kids are not working at 16 anymore. They're going on to degrees and they're having masterships and PhDs and everything, and they're not earning very much at their end of scale either. I don't regret that, I think it's wonderful, but it is a pity to just pick out the older people just on the basis that they're costing money. Here's a gentleman you may recognize. The vision to be amongst the happiest and healthiest places in the world where everyone has equal opportunity to achieve their potential. I think that's great. I mean, I think it's, a, it's, a, it's a, good, a good thing to say. It's a good aim. The difficulty is that it does cost money. In America, the total spend on health is half the world's budget for health. And that's uh, that is for five or just less than 5% of the world's population. So they have a huge um, amount of health expenditure. They rate 26th in the longevity stakes. Guernsey rates probably seven, eight, nine, ten, 10, somewhere around there, it varies, whichever, but you know, reasonably high up. Some of you may recognize this lady. <laughs> I think it's a lovely picture. Uh, Partnership of Purpose, Transforming Healthcare. I think that's a fantastic document. Um, and it received universal acceptance by the states. That is a huge achievement. And I think, as Bella said, it's really beginning to take shape now. It's not a question of one person doing something or one department. It's a question of getting together and all working towards this cause. There's another lady you may recognize here. And of course, the same, it's the same aims. So if we've got all this, surely we don't have a problem. Surely we're all going to, you know, we're going to live in happiness and everything like that. Well, I don't think so. Because it's a whole culture that has to change. I think what has been achieved with Health Connections and all the other organisations which are helping is huge. But it basically, I think, is going to come down to, and I'm teaching to the converted, I know, to us as individuals... I thought about this almost on the way in today, and I thought ageing starts at the moment of conception. I thought, that's a bit scary, really, because we don't have a lot of say in what happens at conception, but there is no doubt that it's very, very important what happens in those nine months. And it is absolutely vitally important what happens in the first two years of life. We know that if we don't pay attention, if we miss a child that's being abused in those first two years of life, the consequences are absolutely awful. But what we are becoming aware of now, I think, is that we need to pay attention to our health all the way through our life, and particularly as we age and become more vulnerable, it's not a lost cause. We need to keep active, to keep doing the things, and then hopefully we can all live in a, in a reasonable state of health and not cost too much money when we go. Now, I just wanted to show you that it's not all is lost because I know some of you still think that the car was probably more important than the old person. I mean, I can't help but say that, you know. Anyway, thank you very much. <laughs>